Hi, I'm Samuel Drews um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this is work I've been doing with my advisors, Al Salbergudi and Laura Stantoni, and also in collaboration with Adit Yanori at uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge. And so in a single sentence, this work is about trying to prove whether or not a program is racist. And because that is a fantastically underspecified description of the problem, I am fortunate to have 20 more minutes to tell you what I actually mean by that. And so for context, uh, a lot of our motivation comes from the way that data is being used in the modern era. Because it's very common for some application to have a ton of data, and you need to make sense of that data. And that's usually a difficult problem, and so it gets outsourced to machine learning, where it spits out some model that does a good job of reflecting the trends and the structure of your data. And because the machine learning people have gotten really good at doing machine learning, you often have nice guarantees that the classifier that you get um, has a small error on the training set, or it might do a good job of generalizing and can be used as a predictive model. And, uh, and those are really nice properties. But the way that society is interacting with technology is now where we have these automated decision-making processes, which sometimes come from machine learning, that make decisions about people. And so if I'm making decisions about people in some kind of systematic algorithmic way, I might care about more than just some sort of training set accuracy. I might you know, start to be concerned, is it possible that my program is capable of discriminating in some sense? Which you know, is actually a realized problem in modern society. And for example, um, last year in the United States, there was a sort of media scandal uh, where the judicial system had been employing a piece of software to try to predict whether someone in court was likely to commit further crimes. And if so, basically whether or not they should be uh, denied bail or jailed immediately or, uh, or whatnot. And, and the website ProPublica posted an article where they claimed that they had performed an analysis and found that this piece of software was disproportionately incorrectly predicting that African Americans would be likely to commit crimes. So in other words, the false positive rate for African Americans was, was some constant factor times larger than white Americans in a way where they decried that, hey, this program is doing something unfair and really we need to do something about it. And it's kind of unclear what you should do about it. It's kind of unclear who is responsible for the unfairness. And it's also not entirely clear what in general we mean when we say that the program is unfair. And so all of these problems are things that are, um, are, are really being investigated in a blossoming field of algorithmic fairness. And, that's, and, and those are some of the problems that we want to tackle with our work. Specifically, we want to define what it means for our program to be fair and have some way to formally reason about it. And so there's been a lot of proposed definitions from the algorithmic fairness community about you know, how do you define fairness. One example um, at a very high level is, is group fairness, that I have some group of people and I want them to be treated equally to some other group of people. And what we're gonna do in this work and what I'm going to do now is provide one way of taking that idea and formalizing it as a mathematical property that we would like to hold for our program. And so suppose that I have some decision-making program D that takes as input a vector V of features that describe a person. And suppose that this program is going to decide whether or not to hire them, and so it outputs a decision of hire them or do not hire them. And we're going to build a horde triple here, where our precondition says that the input V is uh, some set of features where, in particular, we have a bit that specifies whether or not that individual um, as part of some sensitive uh, protected group. And what we might then say for our, for our group fairness post condition, where I want to say that some groups are treated equally, is that I might specify that my program should be as likely to hire someone, given that they are from that protected group, as it would be likely to hire someone who's not in the protected group, or at least within some epsilon factor. And we're talking about probabilities because it's not the case that we're running our code on a single individual but rather we have some population of people, all of whom are potentially subjected to this program. And so we assume that that population is represented as a probability distribution, or more explicitly as a probabilistic program, which is this curvy M, uh, such that when you run the probabilistic program, the population model, it spits out an individual, and you run your program on that individual. 
But if I ran my, pro my uh, population model a bunch of times, it would give me some set of individuals that would look like the empirical distribution for the population itself. And so, so this is one way to formalize a notion of group fairness as a probabilistic property of the program. And there's a bunch of different ways you can define fairness. Instead of talking about as fairness with respect to groups, I might want to make sure that I'm being fair with respect to individuals. And so one way to formalize that in this, in, in this framework is to say that, well, my precondition is that I draw two individuals from my population model. And then if I run my decision-making program on each of them, then my property is going to say that, uh, well, I have some similarity metric. But it's going to say that given that two individuals are similar, the probability that their outcomes are different should be very small. So, um, so again, this was two kind of high-level notions of fairness, group fairness and individual fairness. And I showed here how to concretize those in a formal way. Um, but there's like still a lot of ongoing debate about just conceptually what are good definitions of fairness. Um, and in fact, some of the work in the algorithmic fairness community has shown that group fairness and individual fairness are actually inconsistent. But there are cases where they seem reasonable, and so sometimes they're applicable, sometimes they're not. And just a really fundamental, important problem um, is to just like figure out what are these best notions of fairness that we should care about, and when should we use them. And that's a really, really hard problem. And it's beyond the scope of anything that I want to talk about in this talk, because it fundamentally relies on a broader philosophical discussion about ethics and our values as, a success, values as a society and what we're capable of doing with the law. And, and it's really like, it's very important. It's also very hard. Um, but what we can do, and particularly what we can do within the scope of a programming languages you know, talk, is, we can, um, is that we can do this thing where if you provide a notion of fairness, then you can try to formalize it as some probabilistic expression of program events. And, and that's what I was showing you earlier, is that, is that we want to, uh, to formalize notions of fairness as verification problems for probabilistic programs. And the second part of our work really is about, well, now that I have formalized the verification problem, how do I solve it? Because that turns out to be fairly non-trivial. And to that end, we've built a tool called FairSquare, which does exactly that. It takes as input those three things, the probabilistic program that describes your population, your decision-making program, which could be probabilistic, could be deterministic. Um, usually for us, they're deterministic because they are machine-learned classifiers, but they could be any arbitrary program you write in some restricted language. Um, in particular, for our, for our current implementation, uh, we do not allow loops, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, but then finally, and most importantly, is that FairSquare is completely agnostic to what good definitions of fairness are. Because in addition to the programs, you provide the mathematical expression that you know, says what it means to be fair. And then doing a bunch of fancy math eventually will output either a proof that your program is fair or a proof that your program is unfair. And I guess I just want to clarify now that it's not you know, a human readable proof from a math textbook, but rather more of a mathematical witness to the, to the, um, to the property. And so the reason, I mentioned that in particular we do not allow loops in FairSquare currently. And the really great reason is that by not allowing loops, FairSquare is sound and complete, which are nice properties to have. And furthermore, it's reasonable to, to, to not allow loops because most machine learned classifiers also do not allow loops. And so you can still write them in this kind of framework, as well as just a broader class of programs. So for the remainder of the talk, what I want to do is really just kind of walk through the motivating example in the paper where we illustrate the, uh, the, 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 the way that FairSquare works. And so we're going to build a verification problem. Here is a decision procedure that you can imagine I wrote. And it is used to decide whether or not to hire someone. And this is a really bad way to decide whether or not to hire someone, so please do not take anything from it from this room. But, uh, but here our procedure deck takes as input someone's college rank and their years of experience. And from that, it computes some intermediary score called their experience rank. And then it checks to see if your college rank and experience rank are within some thresholds. If so, it hires you. If not, it doesn't. And, um, and the property that we want to verify is some instance of a group fairness property. Here, we assume that we have a variable that talks about the applicant's ethnicity that's encoded as a real valued number, just again for simplicity. Um, 
And so someone is in a protected group if their ethnicity is greater than 10 in this example. And so we still need to say what our population model is. And so again, it's a probabilistic program where the population model on the left here uh, draws someone's ethnicity, college rank, and years of experience from independent probability distributions. But the end of the population model also includes a mechanism for introducing correlations between some of the features. In particular, people who are, have ethnicity that means they are in the protected group have lower, uh, sorry, have worse college ranks in this population. And so really what we care about is this composition, composition of the two programs. Um, that, you know, the decision making program is run on the outputs of the population model. And I think it's worth highlighting that, you know, the decision making program here by itself it's completely agnostic of ethnicity. It does not use it. And so the, <laughs> whenever you talk to someone about fairness, the very first thing they suggest is, oh, well, simply do not include ethnicity in the program. But that's not sufficient because the population you're running on has this inherent connection between ethnicity and your college rank. And so then since there's that correlation, it might propagate through the decision-making program itself. And that would result in a correlation between the output of the decision-making program and ethnicity regardless of the fact that it is blind to ethnicity. So, so this is our verification problem. Something that I want to point out is that there are no external inputs to uh, the composition of the decision-making program and the population model. So really what that means is that the entire behavior of the program is completely determined by the only sources of non-determinism, which are any instance where you have a probabilistic assignment in, the, in your programs. And uh, the, the importance of that will be clear in a second. Um, but at a very high level, the way that fair square evaluates whether or not this post condition will hold is by computing values for each of the probabilities. Because I'm sure everyone in this room, if you knew what the values of those probabilities were, could tell whether or not the post condition holds. Um, and so what we can do then is that because we have these three values that determine the entire behavior of the program, is that we can look at the region of Euclidean space three-dimensional Euclidean space, one dimension for each value, that, um, that results in those events that we care about. So for example, uh, at some point I'll need to compute the probability that I hire someone and their ethnicity is less than or equal to 10. And so to do that, I look at this region um, shown here, where every point in this region has ethnicity is less than or equal to 10, and the other values are such that going through the decision-making program results in you getting hired. And so explicitly, we have a symbolic representation of this region as a formula in linear arithmetic. And what we want to do to compute the probability of this event is simply integrate over this region with respect to the probability distributions, because that is how you compute probabilities. And, uh, and this is what we call a weighted volume computation. And it turns out that it's kind of hard to do. But before I get to that, I just want to state that encoding things as the arithmetic formula is really straightforward. Again, because we do not allow loops in our program. Because you simply build a formula where for every statement, you have some conjunct. And then the, the translation of the individual statements into, into logic are basically syntactic, where if statements in your program become conditionals and assignments become equalities, and that's actually basically everything you have in your programming language at that point. And then this is for the event higher and ethnicity less than equal to 10 because we include a clause for that as well. So uh, I don't know about you, but when I was in calculus, they didn't teach me how to integrate transcendental functions over arbitrary convex polytopes. And so, so we don't try to do that because even for something as simple as this two-dimensional case where I have a triangle and I would like to integrate this triangle, sorry, integrate um, Gaussian distributions over this triangle, th this is not an easy problem. So phi might describe points inside of this triangle. And so instead of using that, we'll build a new formula called that we denote here as cube phi, um, where, where we, don't, don't worry too much about the, the, the definition here, um, but we throw this formula at an SMT solver, and every model of it, instead of a point inside of the triangle, is in this case a rectangle that is contained within the triangle. And in higher dimensions, it would be a hyperrectangle. And what's nice about this is that we have axis-aligned rectangles, and those are really, really easy to compute weighted volumes of, because you simply compute the weight contribution of each side, which you can do with basically any sufficiently precise uh, scientific computing tool, and then you just multiply those things together. And so this will give us an under-approximation of the weighted volume of the entire triangle. 
uh, right now it's going to be pretty bad. But what we can then do is add appropriate constraints to our solver and grab more and more hyper-rectangular models and compute their weighted volumes. And we do this iteratively until eventually the sum of all of these partial weighted volumes uh, becomes a really good under approximation of the weighted volume of the entire region itself. And that's really how the entire probabilistic inference routine works. There's some fancy stuff we do to make sure that you get good um, hyperrectangles. And uh, so, so just to reiterate then, I have some post condition. It has probabilities in it. For each probability, I get a formula phi that describes that event. And I use exactly what I just showed you to under approximate the weighted volume of phi. But I can also negate phi and do the same thing, and that gives me an over approximation. And so as I sample more and more hyper rectangles using my SMT solver, I eventually get better and better lower and upper bounds for the values of each probability. And so I can propagate those intervals through my post condition, and I can always evaluate whether the post condition at that point is true, false, or undeterminate because my bounds aren't good enough. But eventually, by sampling enough hyperrectangles, uh, we have a convergence result that guarantees that you no longer run into the um, indeterminate case. So to illustrate that, I have a video recorded demo of this uh, example program where uh, all of the inputs are loaded from, from a single text file. And uh, what you'll see is that our post condition involves a ratio of probabilities compared to a constant. And upper and lower bounds for the ratio of probabilities will be displayed in a little graph here. Um, but come on. So there's an initial setup where we have to parse the formulas and then construct the cube phi that we use to um, get the hyperrectangular samples. But then you see as time goes on, the lower bound on the whole ratio and the upper bound on the whole ratio get closer together. And here the solid red line denotes 0.9, which is the constant we're comparing to. And so the, even though we don't get an exact value of the, of the weighted volume, uh, it's still, we have bounds that are precise enough to be conclusive. And uh, so that's a pretty toy example. We did a more rigorous case study where we took a very popular income data set that's used in a lot of these algorithmic fairness papers to, to try to reason about some facet of fairness. And from them, we, in, uh, we inferred a couple of Bayesian networks by assuming structures uh, to use as population models. We also trained a number of, of machine learned classifiers that are pretty common uh, to, to use as decision making programs. And we finally considered a group fairness property with respect to women to use as a post condition. And, uh, and so here's some, and so we, we trained three Bayesian networks, 13 classifiers, and two post conditions, and we tried all possible combinations of those. This is just a cross section for one of the population models, all 13 of the benchmarks, and one of the post conditions, but it's representative across the, the rest of our suite. And uh, here we see that on the 13, um, uh, 13 of these benchmarks, fair square was able to conclusively determine fairness or unfairness for uh, nearly all of them, 11 of the 13. And we had also compared to other tools that are capable of doing probabilistic inference, but because of the structure of these kinds of benchmarks and, and just really the typical structure of the decision boundaries from things you obtain from machine learning, uh, these probabilistic inference tools just either did not scale or were not expressive enough to, to, to be conclusive about the post condition. So um, that's, that, so I mean, that's how we try to tell whether or not programs are racist. I know that I uh, really focused on machine learning as the application, but I do want to emphasize that we're working towards a general verifier for probabilistic programs and probabilistic properties. And already, it is more expressive than just the application of domain learning, uh, machine learning. So thanks for your time, and I'd be glad to take any questions.